Well, you know what today is, right? And don't just say Sunday. And we know it's February, it's February 14th and it falls on a Sunday, and I'm not suggesting to you that the world and its holiday is going to dictate on what we preach on today. However, I really felt like, you know, sometimes we get a real distorted view about love. I'm going to talk about it in many facets today. We're just going to touch on some of these Greek words for love. Some you're going to be very familiar with. And, uh, you know, I remember, I remember my first Valentine's with Sue. We weren't engaged, weren't married, weren't, wasn't engaged yet. And uh, planned this nice little Valentine's picnic. And then it got really cold. So I spread out the blanket and got out the food and she's shaking like this trying to endure and so after 15 minutes we packed it up <laughs> but i tried must have worked still with me yeah i remember when i first saw her it was i was only starting my first full time ministry position and some of you would have heard this um but first full time ministry position i think it was I I think it was my second day in the office, or maybe it was my first full day in the office, and uh, there was a, a sitting area and office staff, and around that were, you know, pastor's offices, and I was sitting in my office, and my office door was open, and, and walks by this I, I just, I don't... Please forgive me, but I don't know how else to say it. it Walked by this really smoking hot chick. <laughs> and she goes, and I just kind of glanced up, and she sat down, and all I could see from where she was sitting and where she positioned herself in that waiting area, she was coming to visit the former youth pastor who became an associate pastor, and then they hired me as the college and career and youth pastor at this I don't know, 1,200-person church, large place. And, and uh, she sat there, and I glanced, and all I could see is she's sitting there with her legs crossed, and I can only see from this part down, which was enough for me. She had on these floral little flats, and she's, you know, bouncing, and it's like, she's got some great ankles. And then I started the self-talk. That is not why you came here. You keep your mind on your no job, full-time ministry. You just, you got to keep your mind on the things of the Lord and reaching youth and get a plan from God and a vision and the college and the, I, you know, just straighten up, boy. That is not why you're here. Boy, I self-talked all the time and failed. Saw her on other occasions. She was off at university, would come home on weekends. University was only, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half away or something. She'd come on weekends, go to church. Um, so, you know, kind of got to meet her around other people. I mean, I was doing college and career ministry and youth ministry in this church. And so I was busy, you know, all day, ministry in the evenings, et cetera, kind of. But, get, you know, she'd come home on weekends, got kind of familiar and, a little friendly towards her, and, you know, at the time she was, I don't know, dating the wrong guy, <laughs> obviously, and uh, I wanted to ask her out, and uh, so I went to the associate pastor. He was the pastor that I directly reported to, you know, when you have a lot of pastors on staff in a church of 1,200, you just, you got to, you answer to, you know, there's layers of leadership. So went to him and said, listen, there's this, there's this girl that I'd like to ask out. And if you say no, don't worry about it. I will not ask her out. It's a mute issue. Don't worry about it. But this Sue Parmar, I'd like to take her out and I want to know if it's okay. He said, uh, I'll let you know. I'm gonna, I'll talk to the senior pastor about it. 
I said, okay, good. And it was a day or two later. Um, he came back. We chatted about whether I could ask this girl out, you know, submit myself to the authorities over me. That was, I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, new place, new job, all of that. And so um, he came back and said, well, she's one of our favorite girls in the church. And so I want you to know that you can ask her out, but there's, there's a condition with it. I said, okay, what's the condition? That <clears throat> you guys keep it private and quiet. Um, we don't want it to appear that you're coming here and you're going to date a bunch of women and it just creates some perceptions and stuff within the body and within the, the church and affects the ministry that, you know, college that you're kind of, you know, that not kind of, but that you're leading. And so we just, you know, just in these early stages and when you go out on dates, just keep it quiet. And so I said, okay. Asked her out. She said yes. <laughs> Why wouldn't she? <laughs> I'm kidding you. <laughs> uh, I love to lie to myself and make myself feel good. Anyhow, um, you know, uh, she said yes, you know, because the musician, she was dating or whatever, they, you know, whatever. <clears throat> Um, and I uh, told her the condition. She agreed, just kind of, we got to keep it on the down low. So it involved very creative dating because, you know, large church. I mean, it's a lar- it was a large city, but still, you just don't know when you're going to bump into somebody. So it was just kind of creative hours. And I, I was burning the candle at both ends, you know, working hard at this new ministry, my first place, carrying out commitment and all those things and doing that and then being interested in this girl, this young woman. Man, I, I was going without sleep for the most part, you know. I mean, some of our dates had to be late at night because couldn't be seen, you know. Had to keep it so just... You know, and of course, you know how it is, don't you? I mean, Isaac, you should see him when he comes to the office. Chasing this girl. Anyhow. Oh, I mean, you, you remember that? You, you remember that? Just kind of young interested, attracted, didn't even really know them well, but, you know, you feel like, you know, you got hit by the thunderbolt, you know? And uh, I remember that. You know, there's, there's things along the way in this life that start to impact us very early of how we perceive love or falling in love or romantic love or you've been married for decades and you kind of go, hmm... Not like it was, what happened, or it's changed, it's different. Is that okay? Is that good? Are my expectations different? Are they the same? But now it's, and we just, and as believers, some of us, you know, we evaluate our relationship or our marriage based on some expectations we've had that maybe aren't fulfilled or they've changed and we think is something wrong and we panic or we and we get this distorted view. I mean, let's face it, you know, you can you can blame whoever. You, you can blame Hollywood and the movies we see or the commercials we watch or what other people do or say or what you observe somewhere. You know, but I, I will tell you the first impact of this whole idea of love and marriage or what relationships are to be, we find it first in the home we grew up in. And I know for some, you know, we didn't, we didn't grow up with maybe a dad present or a mom present or, you know, um, maybe they were there and um, their marriage didn't make it and then maybe there was other people coming. And we just, all of this impacts us and we're like, you know, what's going on? And we, 
we carry the impact of all of these things with us that shape how we look at this. You know, when we look at Valentine's Day, right away we think, you know, romantic, you know, love, and, you know, now you've been married for a few decades, and I don't know, maybe your day consists of, well, it's cold, and ah, there's COVID, and ah, we're not going to really go out to eat, and I don't know, we'll just kind of go home, and I don't know, I'll watch TV and eat a hot dog, and, you know, throw a I love you at you, and call it good. And um, hopefully you put a little more effort and thought into it than that, but you know, so I want to I want to go over these words for biblical love, and and they're they're Greek words. We're, we're going to use mostly Greek words here. We're going to look at a scripture in the Old Testament um, near the end, and uh, also look at a New Testament verse. But I, I want to walk us through some things that you know some you're familiar with, and some maybe you're not. And I want to talk about this love between a man and a woman in the context of marriage, and how it changes and matures, and the bond that we develop is greater than what the relationship started with. Because I will tell you that when I hold my wife's hand today, it's not like when I first held her hand. I mean, I wanted to hold her hand. I, I mean, and holding her hand, when I first held her hand, I mean, it's like the 4th of July. You know, I mean, it, and then, you know, I wanted to hold her hand again. Then I wanted to hold it longer. Then I wanted to hug her. And then I wanted to kiss her. You're like, oh, no, run the children out of the room. The pastor wanted to kiss us. I did. I'm just telling you, I did. It, there was a, an attraction. It, it was emotional. It was physical. I mean, it, it, you know, just kind of how some of your relationships developed. I hold her hand today. I will tell you. It's not the 4th of July. Oh, there's still times it still feels really good. But when I hold her hand now, it speaks of something else. See, this year is going to be 34 years being married to this woman. When I hold her hand now, it, it's not about all the sparks and the euphoria. And the, I mean, it still feels good. And I still like it very much. But when I hold her hand now, it represents life together, battles won, forgiveness, making it work. Living with disappointment at moments in each other and yet still being together. Raising a family together. Growing in faith in the Lord together. You see, there's such a fulfillment and contentment and gratitude with that that at 24, 23 years old, there's no way possible I could know that. You see... Some of the young love and passion and energy and sparks and euphoria and 
you know, burning the candle at both ends and just couldn't get enough of being around her. That all takes a back seat. to what God has helped us develop. Now, <clears throat> that's not to say that there's still a little ember and spark in the old boiler here still, and desire appropriate within marriage. But this, this, this means something that I didn't know anything about in my 20s. And so busy raising kids, not even sure I knew it in my late 20s and when I turned 30. I want to talk to you about these different biblical loves and we're going to end up talking about developing this relationship and or some of you moving towards marriage or some of you in marriage or in marriage a long while. And, and listen, I, I want you to know that I know there's people here this morning or watching who maybe your marriage didn't make it or you lost a spouse. I got good news for you. The Lord knows he's watched and he will be everything to you. And if you have kids at home, he'll still be a father to those kids and the Lord knows how to do it. I don't know what it is to be in your shoes because my wife is still alive. So I won't pretend. I'm just telling you I know what the word says and I know the Lord and he knows how to take care of you. And he can bring joy into your heart and into your life. It's who he is. He's got his eye on you especially. I'll tell you that. So let's talk about these loves. We hear one that's very common, with, you know, phileo love. We, we know it's called a friendship love. But I want you to know it's, there's an aspect of this that you really don't hear explained a lot. And so I'm not going to dive into all of these in their fullness description because I'm going to work our way through to two loves that develop through time. And the bond of those that these two loves bring outweighs anything that's physical or emotional or in the shallow end. Some of those things we carry along with us through time, but they will take a back seat to the two I'm going to talk about a little bit later. This phileo love, I want you to understand this friendship love is, is not a, uh, hey, I met this person a couple times, I'm going to introduce them to somebody and say, hey, this is my friend so-and-so. That, that's not phileo love. We call them friend. You know, our, our English language is not like Greek and many other languages. You know, we use love, and it has a variety of meanings. Uh, in the Greek, they have very specific words for love so that you understand the distinctness of it and the depth of it, what they're talking about. And you and I, we grew up here, so when I say I love pizza and I love my family, you know those, you hope, those are two very different loves. You all know that I love pizza way more than, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> love my family way more, okay? So friend is, and then there's others who you've been through thick and thin. You've spent a lot of time together. You've done stuff together. This friendship, when you say, oh, I want to introduce you to my friend, that, that's phileo. It's, it's not this other, like, I've met you a couple times. Yeah, I like you, or we've done something. But the, the phileo friendship, this is my friend. It consists of this, that my relationship with them has caused me to change for something better. I've, through my relationship with them, that person has helped change me for the good. And the opposite is true. Their relationship with me, somehow it has changed them and it has heightened who that person is. They've gone through change. That's what this phileo, Greek, friendship definition is of a friend. And hopefully that's a part of our life, that we have someone that has impacted us so much, it has made us better. You see, through that, and guys hate this word of intimate, but the friendship was intimate enough where we were humble and we were vulnerable enough, little by little, 
that we allowed ourselves to be impacted and changed because of this person, and they did the same. That person is a friend. Phileo love. Um, another that is talked about in the scripture is also uh, fellatio love, and that is a healthy love of self. Not an unhealthy love, not where like we're enamored with ourselves, or we're caught up in, if I do this and I talk to this person or I know them or I have this vehicle or I have this house or I have these clothes or I have this, that that is my identity and then people can think that's who I am. No, that's an unhealthy love for self. We have some image problems um, that we need to work on if that's the case. And the love for self has to do with this healthy image of I don't need to have or do all those things to identify who I am or the value, how I see myself valuable. We can have those things or know those people or whatever, that's immaterial. It, that wasn't the goal to have value of self. You see, the value of self is we can understand that we can be hurt and rejected and it doesn't send us into a tailspin. And we know who we are and who the Lord has called us to be and the Holy Spirit has helped us. And that there's no ill motives in the things that we buy or decide to do or who we talk to or how we conduct ourselves, whatever. That, that, is, that is not where we find value. We find the value and that who God has made us and called us to become and our response to him and how we deal with the problems and difficulties and issues of this life and it doesn't send us into a tailspin and God can discipline us and we don't have to go into a depression for you know 30 days and we, yeah, it stings, I've gotta work this out we, and we get back on track and he moves us along and it's the same thing in our human relationships. That is this healthy self-love. It's a healthy image that we have. And, you know, if that speaks to you this morning, you know, you pray and you, you, you work on that. Allow the Holy Spirit to work on that in us. Um, another love I want to mention is, um, you know, agape is talked about a lot. <clears throat> agape love, we know it is the unconditional love. And I want you to know that, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. When we read the word love throughout the New Testament, most of the time we just think, oh, well, that's unconditional love. I know what that means. And we just get this picture of unconditional love. I want you to know a little more about this unconditional love that we just think it's always agape because it's not always agape. Agape is an unconditional love. I mean, that part, that part we've, we've got right, but it's kind of the, the context is that this agape love is more a love of the mind than a love of the heart. It's more a love of the mind than the heart because unconditional love is a principle we live by. You see, issues of the heart, they're, they change. Uh, emotional, uh, sentiment, uh, some of the affection things are swayed by emotion. When we know to think right, right, we're, we're, we follow Christ, we, we're no longer conformed to the patterns of this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans chapter 12, and we are renewed in our minds, in our thinking, because how we think and what we understand and what we know to be true is what's supposed to direct our life. So this unconditional love is a, is a love of the mind because it decides that this is going to be a principle of my life, and regardless of what I feel in my heart, whether I feel compassion, whether I feel affection, or I feel sentiment, or if I'm excited about this, or if I'm inconvenienced, it doesn't matter. Because I'm living according to this principle. Because I am called by Jesus Christ to be like him. To love unconditional. And the interesting thing is about unconditional love, which we are supposed to show to our family and those we know in the body of Christ. But it's interesting, the unconditional love is really speaks in the context of most of the time is that we show an unconditional love. A love that's not earned, a love that's not repaid, and not someone can repay us. It's a love that we show to a stranger. We don't necessarily know them. We don't know that they can repay us. We don't want them to repay us. It's not a love that we're giving to someone as a repayment for how they loved us or treated us or done something for us. 
The unconditional love expression is actually very temporary, usually shown to a stranger or someone who we don't really know or think they deserve it. It's, it doesn't matter. It's an expression of love. It's an expression of help that we give as, a, as God has done to us and gave himself for us. And then we in turn do that for others who we know, who we don't know, people that maybe can never pay us back, not that we're looking for that, but we just do it. It's interesting, we've discovered about humanity is that when we decide to do something and do something right and build this pattern in our life, our emotions tend to eventually get in line and we start to feel good about it. You, you know when you do something that you, for somebody... You, you, you express this unconditional love. It was kind of exciting, and after the fact, you feel pretty good about it. And, and I don't mean in the sense of arrogance or like, hey, I'm pretty good, or I was a good Christian today. No, you just you feel right. Our emotions got in line with what our mind chose to do according to a principle that we live by. And I want you to know that's how emotions work. If emotions are leading us, it's like, do I feel like helping this person today? Oh, they're attractive. I think I'll help them. Or, oh, I just, I feel sad for them. Or, I just feel inconvenienced. Or, I, I, don't, I don't really know them, and we could, I just feel uncomfortable, so I'm not going to help them. You see, the emotions go like this, right? But when we live by the principle and we choose to do it, our emotions eventually get in line, and there's joy and excitement about it. And it's not like, hey, I want to feel good about me, so I'll go help somebody. That's not the motive. It's that I'm living to the principle, and what happens is the emotions follow. That's why unconditional love is so important. It's a reflection of God. Actually, all of these loves have a, a, a reflection of God and who he calls us to be. I'm going to share another uh, Greek word for you. It's uh, lotus love. Um, L-U-D-U-S is <clears throat> it's a playful love and it's not that you know when you work towards marriage I mean it's nice to have a little playfulness <laughs> you know I do that at home with Sue I do <laughs> I do Sometimes she likes that, and sometimes she don't, <laughs> which makes me do that all the more. Oh, naughty. Playful, it's good. Here's the thing. If we're looking at playful... Here's, here's the part where it, that's, it can be part of this relationship. And sometimes that's what it kind of starts with, you know, a little flirting, a little playful. Here, here's, the, here's the drawback, is that doesn't last because that context of love has no obligation or commitment to it. Those of you who uh, have dated more, than the person, more people than just the person you married... There's proof. That didn't last. Eros love. I know, there's children in the room. Sexual, sensual love. Not going to go into all that. You pretty much have an idea about that. and um, We should talk about it more, but in a godly context, but... This morning, it's, we're just going to identify it, and I want you to know that that sexual, sensual attraction that we had in the early days, because you know, she had great ankles, and beautiful hair, and she noticed me. The story came out later. She noticed me, too, that day. It's why she sat out of vision so she, I wouldn't catch her staring at all this. 
Well, there was a lot less of this back then. <laughs> Listen. Hey. That, that, I got to tell you, the, the emotion and the desire and the passion, I got to tell you something. I didn't know it back then because I was immature. That's the shallow end. And that may be how some relationships started. There was attraction and, you, and Lotus and you playful a little bit. But that, I'm just telling you, it doesn't, that, that doesn't, that's not what a relationship is going to make it last. Now, it doesn't mean that has to all go away. I mean, God created that to be a part of our relationship and to, you know, um, understand, you know, procreation and recreation, all that he involved in, inside of marriage and, you know, what, part of building the bond between two people and, and all of that. But, but understand, I hold her hand now. It's not euphoric like in 1986, 87, 88, 89. I can keep going. This was after we were married. I just, you know. It's, something's changed. I didn't know that back then. You could have told me and I'd go, oh yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not telling you there can't be a spark or there still shouldn't be some of these things that we bring along with us in our relationship. I'm just telling you when I get to these final two descriptions of love in the context of the Bible and God's purpose and plan that this emotional uh, and lo lotus and eros, it takes a way back seat to what's going to come. And some of you might think, oh, no, there's not like we used to be. And, uh, listen, there are some things that we still need to do that we did at the beginning so that we don't lose our first love. But there are some, that is not the be-all, end-all. There is a development and something that is supposed to evolve. In other words, that the Holy Spirit brings and matures and it changes, and with good reason. So I want to talk to you about these other two loves. You got the first five. So here's these other two. One is called storge. Or some might say storge, but it, it, most of the pronouncement is storge. And this is a family love. You see, our kids have grown up and left the home. No, I'm kidding you. I miss them some days. Um, no, <laughs> we enjoyed our home life. I'm just messing with you. But it's a family love. Well, here's the thing. The kids left home. It's not, oh, my family's gone. Sue still chooses to live with me. It, our family's bigger. It's not like we disassociated our kids or anything like that. But in our household, it's two of us. We're family. There was a time where she was not my family. She married me, and back then, even before we had kids, I wasn't like, we're family. I wasn't thinking in those terms. Her and our family, we're husband and wife, but I wasn't thinking like, hey, we're family. This had to come and develop and wave through the child-rearing years and after they left is an understanding that there is a family love here. Let me put it to you this way. Um, those of you who have family... You'll totally get this. Um, let's start here. A mother, or she hasn't even been born yet. The, the child is in her womb. She loves this child. She loves this child. She loves this child. Now, this child does not recognize that it's, it's loved. The child can't even reciprocate that it's loved. Even after the child is first born, this mother loves this child, but this child doesn't recognize it, can't reciprocate it, but she loves this child. And the child might get a little colic here. It's got its days and nights mixed up and as frustrated and tired and exhausted as she gets, she loves this child. How many of you have siblings? Some of you, 
you maybe got along real good with your siblings or one of your siblings or none of your siblings or whatever it is, or you, I mean, it just maybe there's one or two or all of them that just totally frustrated you, irritate you. you, you would say, I can't stand them. You never maybe would bring yourself to say you hate them. Maybe you did. And then somebody outside the family picked on them. You're going to come to their defense and come to their rescue and get mad at that person, and yet you hate your sibling. That is family love. That's love in your family. That's what God puts here. Now I want you to, I want you to translate this now in, through a, a, a parallel here that this is God's family. And there's likely people in this room who, hi, and you're nice, but you really don't want to go out and have dinner with them. Or there's something about their personality that rubs you the wrong way, or uh, just something you don't care for about them, and all of that. But we are called to love the family. And here it is, all of a sudden they go through hardship. Next thing you know, you're showing up at their door with a dinner for them. There are some people in this room you don't find it easy to love. But you love them. Because they're family. You see, that's a maturity that comes. There's something about, there's a depth to that. And so this storge love is, it's like that. Understand it's almost like a one-way love. You may not really feel loved by them. Maybe you grew up with a mom or dad. You just, man, I don't really feel loved by them. I, in fact, I, you know, there's times I wished they, they were different or I had a different parent or whatever it is. But then they get sick. And you show up. Or you go care for them. Or you, see, that's family love. Sticking with your spouse when you might feel like it's one way. You see, Eros ain't going to cover that. Playfulness ain't going to make up for that. It's a family love. We raised four kids. They were all within four and a half years old from youngest to oldest. Even as they got older, even as they're adults, they've had their conflict from time to time. And then one of them going through a hard time or trouble, one of those siblings or more, they show up to give or help or fight on their behalf. See, that's going to sustain a relationship. That's what's going to sustain your marriage. Because the flirty arrow stuff, as nice as that is, as wonderful feeling as it is, It ain't going to see you through those storms of life. And those storms and troubles of life, they come for all of us. And it's where we get to show the maturity of God and what he has shown to us that we now give to someone else and certainly give to our family and to our spouse. I'll share this last thing with you. It's called pragma. It's the word for love, pragma. This Greek word and pragma, it's not going to sound real exciting to you. But pragma falls in the realm of a love that the relationship you have with the person is familiar. The relationship has become familiar. Now, we know that familiarity breeds contempt. 
But this is not a familiarity like with no effort. It's not that concept. It's the concept of it's familiar. I know you and you know me. I don't have to question your motive because I am, we're familiar with one another. Kind of like, why are you being nice to me? Extra special. Or why are you giving me the back rub? Are you about to hand me like the visa bill? You're being nice because there's leverage or some, or I got to cover something up or I got, no, 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 no. This, this is familiar. I know you and you know me and there's no manipulating. There's no leveraging. There's no work in the other person. We're familiar and it is a security and there's a safety. It, within this pragma love is this love that um, we, it, it comes with time, experience. It, it, it changes because we didn't have it to the depth that we do now later in life or through time and more time. It's this. Pragma love says in its definition, we learn to make it work. We learn to make it work. Can I tell you, I'm going to tell you how I discovered that I loved my wife, Sue. Now, you'd be thinking, what do you mean you discovered? You just told us that you were all woo-hoo-hoo over her. I was. But I know that that was feeling and wanting to spend time with her and wanted to hold her hand and, you know, wanted to look at her and all of that. And woo! But we were going through the relationship, and there were different points where I could have gotten out of the relationship with her. And it would have been acceptable and it would have been appropriate from my perspective. And I found myself walking past the exit points. So I was having the feelings, but I also know that I had past, you know, dating experiences where I, I'm going to get out of this now and uh, yeah, I'm going to get out of this now. Whatever. I found myself making effort to really make this work. It was like a flight of stairs. At each flight, you got the exit door. You can get off, right? I found myself recognizing the exit door, but staying in the relationship. And staying in the relationship. And staying in the relationship. Pragma was starting to spread its roots. And I discovered that it wasn't just the feeling. That I was choosing to make this work. And therefore that equals that I love her. Pragma, learning to make it work. And those were just the beginning roots. We're, we're, 30, we're 34 years into this. We have learned to make it work, and it's nobody else's marriage. It's ours. And when we hold hands, it may not be euphoric, but there is such a depth to this that brings such contentment such fulfillment, a testimony of God's mercy, grace, purpose, appointment, forgiveness, healing. Something that the shallow end cannot know. A pragma love, it says, I'm more interested in making this work I'm more interested staying in this because of qualities, compatibilities, recognizing different interests, and it is okay for you to go and do your interests. It's okay for me to go do mine. It doesn't mean we're living separate lives. We still come together. But there's a trust, and there's a liberty, and there's a...
Not when we were first dating. Well, it's Friday night. What do you mean you're going to go out with some guys? <laughs> you're going to break up with me. You don't like me. <laughs> you kidding me? That wasn't it. Just had a different plan, different interests that night. So you worked through that stuff. Now she can't wait till I go out with the guys. <laughs> see, see, things through experience and through redemption, through walking with the Lord, there's, there's all, you can bring these loves forward and they should still be a part, but they, sh- they are not the things, these early love, it, this romance, this thing that they sell you in Hollywood that, oh, they fall in love and then they have this terrible falling apart and less than two hours it's all back together again and yay, and then the credits roll. I'm telling you, nothing in my marriage looked like that. It's not how it worked. You see, the satisfaction and fulfillment of a pragma and being familiar and a contentment that comes. So some of you who are evaluating your marriage thinking, oh, it's not sparks, it's not... Just calm down, take a breath. It doesn't mean you're in trouble. It doesn't mean you're falling apart. Granted, maybe there still needs to be some of those things brought into your marriage that you didn't work at and let slide. But I want you to also recognize the maturing that can come and the contentment and fulfillment and the desire and expectation should be different than what it was. Don't let your expectations remain the same for when you were married 20-some years ago and now your life has changed and matured some. Listen, your expectations, not all of them are going to translate. You have some new ones. You have some new contentments. You have some new commitments. You're finding satisfaction in having a family. Listen, I always wanted to have a family, but I didn't want to have one at 21. Oh. That family type thing had to grow and establish in me. And then once we had one, boy, did we have them. So when you come to a day like Valentine's and it's uh, some holiday or maybe you recognize it, whatever, and then you try to put it in the context of Christianity and where does that fall and where does it... Listen, those of you in young love... Enjoy it appropriately within the design of God's word. God help you not to compromise. So that you can plant good seeds that you have good fruit later. Not that you plant bad seed and now that fruit's going to show up. That difficulty, that relationship. From honor God. And let him develop. Let him grow. And I know that if it's young love, you, you, you don't quite grasp all this stuff, how it's fulfilling, it sounds boring. I want to go and woohoo, be restless, exciting, and do all. Hey, there's still some of that in later life, but that stuff that feeds you and excites you now, I want you to know it will, and it's supposed to, take a back seat to the family love and the pragma love that develops in a relationship. Listen, you can put this in the context of new Christians, and I remember, I was so passionate, and I'll tell you what, I still have, I, I will say, I still have some very emotional, exciting moments with the Lord, but it, it, it's not every day that I feel all lit up in my emotions, but there is such a contentment and such a knowing and a familiarity, and I still need to grow in the Lord. I don't mean coast, I, but there is such a, a depth that's come that was not there in the early days. And I needed him to excite me, and I needed him to kind of touch me emotionally, and I, I needed that to, you know, ooh, it's new and keep you growing. But as time goes on, I didn't need that as much. I'm still thankful for it. I still have that. But that stuff ain't going to see me through trials and tribulation. And so there has to be a maturing and a commitment and understanding that comes I want to read this to you from Deuteronomy chapter 6 very quickly. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is after they received the Ten Commandments, and God is speaking to them and saying, here's these commandments. I want you to live by them, and I want you to teach your children. Watch this. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be um, frontless between your eyes and write them on your doorposts. And listen, what he's saying is these commands, as you give them, I expect you to live by them, but... I expect you to talk about them, live them, show them to your children. Now, I want you to put this in the context of love. God's love, his commands, the way we're supposed to love. Listen, if, if we don't show this to our kids, what's appropriate, what's right, and commitment, and family love, and appropriate affection, and all of these things... Because this, understand, children are first going to experience it and begin to learn about it in the home they grow up in. That's where they have to learn about it. And as believers, that's where we should be, is talking, showing, and letting our kids catch it. So that they understand it. And they will see a contrast between what maybe they learned at home and what they see in the world. You see, many of us who have issues, we didn't get to see it in the home like it should have been. And we're believers, and Christ empowers us, and we're forgiven and all of that, but we, we got these hang-ups. We brought these things into our marriage and into our relationships because this was not shown. Something else was shown to us. Or something else was shown we didn't want, so we had a guess. Or we get caught up in the culture, what somebody else did, or what we watched, or somewhere we developed some thought, and it's other than God. Listen, put this in the context of the church. People who are newer believers, and they come at all ages, in the body of Christ, where is it that they're going to learn how to love, and what love is, and how we treat one another? And how it can be exciting, but there's also a commitment that comes with it. You see, put this all in the context of the body of Christ. And, and what about the actual children around here? What are they watching and what are they seeing in, in you here at church? What are they seeing in me? What, what is it they, what is it? Are we talking about it? Are we showing? You see, we can talk about this love and come into a day of romantic love and well, what does it mean? And you might have some expectation or from some movie you showed or some culture thing and, and wherever you're at in your relationship and I'm just telling you that be focused on him. He is love. He's got words here that are biblical love and how they play out and how they're a part of our life. He created Eros love. And within his design and context, it's wonderful. It's supposed to be there. Playful. But it can't stop there because playful is not, it's without obligation. And the unconditional love, the agape love, the flail love, and willing to love ourselves, like he writes in Ephesians, a man should care for his own body and love his wife in the same manner. Self-love and love her. And that what comes and develops in time that keeps people together is this understanding and involvement in family, love and conviction, and in this love that's very pragma. It chooses to make it work. It chooses to make it work. And it's about the other person. It's not just about us. And we can be hurt by them, but it doesn't send us in a tailspin because push come to shove. We're holding hands. We're making it work. And God is helping us. And there's a grace and a mercy. We're intent on this. Why don't you stand up, please? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness. Now listen to this. With patience, bearing with one another in love. 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I, I, do I still frustrate my wife? Of course. Does she still frustrate me? Mm-hmm. You know what I've learned? Not always, but sometimes the frustration that I feel, that I think she does that frustrates me, is actually not what she does. The question is, why am I getting frustrated over this? What do I need to change about me? The frustration is my fault, not hers. This context here where, where it talks about the body of Christ, bearing with one another. What about when they got a quirk or something you don't care for? The love that's talked about here has to do with the love that actually is not heartless, but it has affection and benevolence with it. In other words, I am going to be good to you whether I feel you deserve it or not, and I'm going to give you something you don't have, or I'm going to show you a grace that you need. See? Bear with one another. Be patient. Bear with one another in love. That's what we're called to do for one another. It's a benevolent, pragma, family blending of loving one another. You got to bear with one another. Oh, they sinned. I got to distance myself. Oh, they did something. It embarrasses the name of the church. If I am with them, it shows, it means like I condone it or think it's okay. No, it doesn't. Don't take the bait of that. We're supposed to bear with one another in love. You ever had somebody in your family embarrass your family name? From your perspective? But their family doesn't mean what they did is okay, but it doesn't give us license not to love them. See, we need to bear with one another and love one another with a pragma, with a family love, because it glorifies the Lord. And it's who he has been to you and I. All of these loves have been given to us to be aware of and to live by within his parameter and demand. So I don't know how you're going to spend your Valentine's Day. For some of you, it might be going out and having a picnic. <laughs> no. If you are familiar with me at all, today is not the day to do a picnic. Uh, maybe it's going out. Maybe it's watching an appropriate movie or snuggling somewhere or having a meal at home. or Maybe it's just casual. Maybe it's discovering when you hold hands today. Maybe for some of you it still sparks. Enjoy it. Don't let it lead you astray, but enjoy it. For some, it feels good, but holding hands without even saying a word, it tells a story. God's helping you make it. You made it through a lot. There's such content and gratitude. It just looks like Jesus walking with us, walking with people through all the hurts and Flaws and valleys, all the good times too. So careful how you look at this day. Don't let this culture taint it for you. Remember what's most important. Love the Lord. Love people.